but that the asset or that the ore body straddles both Argentina and Chile. As we understand it, there's a, a bilateral agreement between the two, but how do you practically think through that? Is it twice as many environmental approvals, approvals with the, the native titles? Where we're at right now, which is exploration, we have this agreement that exists it effectively we sort of control the border ourselves. So the, the re, really the only rules are if you go in from Chile, you have to exit the project from Chile and vice versa. Obviously complications as you start moving towards towards production. And, and what it means really is, is a duplicate of reporting. In my interpretation, to kind of get the most out of the project in the long run, it's, it'd probably require a desalination plant and a, and a pipeline from the coast to provide that water. 90% of what's sort of what we found and almost all of the drilling that we're doing right now is entirely in Argentina. We have access to groundwater there. You know, the long term, I guess, plan B here is it, it wouldn't take that much for the broader Lundin group to think about building out that desalination facility, tying into the Casarones water pipeline, and then ultimately being able to deliver desalinated water up to the, up to the high Andes. Right, g'day, Money Miners. We're heading across the ditch to the remote area, not physically, but we're talking about the Philo Del Sol project today with the CEO of Philo Corp, Jamie Beck. This thing is fucking huge. It's on. It's going to be huge. It's on the border of Argentina and Chile. It's a massive epithermal porphyry copper gold silver deposit. Uh, well, they've got a couple of billion market cap for yeah. an exploration Canadian company. Canadian two and a half billion dollar market cap. It's yeah. still early stage. They don't no, not even any guidance for a mineral um, resource for the whole thing yet. Mm. I mean, it's um, fascinating because here in Australia and on the ASX, we really lack a good copper development story. So you, you have to kind of look to the North Americans to, to get that. This one is a bit of a standout when you look at the, the 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 universe of great undeveloped potential projects that could be a like like you look at it and you think this this has the potential to you know be decades 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 potentially even um, century long century long mining at some point given its scale but it's still early stage and keen to really learn about it, Matty. Yeah, it looks like and you looked at I think it was what was it over seven kilometres strike and they're hitting mineralisation still at. 1,800 metres deep, like it's uh, pheno yeah, phenomenal. But as you said, once the resource comes out in the future, we'll see how the grade stacks up against deposits like OU Tolgoy and Carcebel and other large-scale operations like that and your yeah, Escondidas yeah, and all yeah, that. Yeah, your Chiqui so, Tomatas and the like in the area. Yeah, so no, interesting. Uh, boys, we, we intro it in there. Let's get into it. Uh, sponsor for this episode, who else would you pick that could maybe service the Philo Del Sol project. Anytime exploration services would be my go-to call, Matty. Because it's they could service at any time, but with their anywhere mandate, <laughs> yeah. anywhere, if uh, they need a bit of Australian exploration experience just to tick the diversity box, I reckon Seamus Murphy could send a heap of lads and ladies over there to help drill some 1,800 metre deep holes and collect the and cut the core of 1,800 metres worth of fucking hole. I've yeah. got a bit of a word about these guys, Matty. Word on the decline. They don't just do exploration. They also do production. Do they? So it's and anything they, as well. Anything. <laughs> they do mining. They do bloody uh, – they could oh, – they're probably going to get into – if they get this contract, I'll get a plane. They do – they hire out – Utes, LVs, and bloody trucks and everything. Word on the decline, Seamus is going to get a Learjet to take the workers over to the Andes. Can you imagine how big the core shed they'd have as well, Matty? Oh. Over 120 kilometres of drilling already. It's all there, you know, it'd be all over it. Can Seamus do – Talk about clipping a ticket. If we can get Seamus this contract, <laughs> boys, we are set. Can Seamus do any altitude? <laughs> any altitude, anytime, anywhere, any altitude. 4,000 4, metres, doesn't matter. Yeah. Doesn't oh, matter. Mate, get on to any time exploration. Actually, probably get in quick before he gets the Philo Del Sol contract. He'll be maxed out. And because uh, – He's, that'll be a priority. So probably get in now before that happens and we <laughs> clip the ticket. Thanks anytime for your support. Love your work, Seamus and Victoria. Right, boys, let's get into it. Chat with uh, CEO Jamie Beck from Philo Corp. Rip it. Here we go. Right, oh, money miners, here we go. We're getting into, we're heading over to Chile and Argentina, right on the bloody, right on the line. <laughs> we do, we've got uh, Jamie Beck, CEO and President 
of Philo Mining. Got him on for a bit of a grilling today. It's Philo it's Corp now, Matty. Philo, Change Philo of name. Corp. Yeah. When we say <laughs> grilling, Jamie, it ain't your usual investor relations fluff fest, mate. We hopefully got some good, good, <laughs> que- good questions for you, mate, and uh, it should be should be a good yarn. Good. Thanks for having me on. Absolute pleasure, mate. Now, yeah, background for everyone, we went through it a bit at the start. Philo Corp, Canadian $2.5 billion exploration company listed on the TSX, got a long and intriguing history. So they're onto a, a huge epithermal copper gold silver deposit in the South American Andes. And when you think Andes, you think high altitude and dry and in the middle of nowhere. 4,000 <laughs> metres above sea level. I remember walking around Peru Um and I couldn't even bloody breathe walking up the hill. I think that was only <laughs> oh, two or 3,000. So how do you go up 4,000 metres, Jamie? It's, it's, you need to watch our drillers from Salta who are up there smoking cigarettes on the side of the drill. No <laughs> You'd be lucky to light the bloody thing, I think. Um, so, yeah. look, look, well, uh, I'm sure you're well aware of these hits, Jamie, since you've run the show. Uh, 1.4 kilometres at 1.13 copper equivalent, 1.2 kilometres at 0.83 copper equivalent. So she's a bit bigger than the copper intersections we see in Australia, money miners. And, uh, look... No point in me talking about this, Jamie. You're a Lundine Group company. Tell us a bit about that. Lundine being the biggest shareholders. Yeah, you know they they it's a number of different publicly traded companies uh, across the energy sector. There's an oil and gas side as well as the as well as the mining side. Typically split between either commodity and or stage of development. So Philo is is one of the groups. Uh, junior, call it uh, exploration or, or, or discovery companies in the in the base metal space. Lundin Mining, of course, being the, the senior producer and the, and the one that's uh, that's actually digging stuff out of the ground. So that you know, what binds us together is is family ownership, and that's really the theme that that runs through all of it. And in our case, the Lundin family holds about thirty three percent of the outstanding shares. And you'll see that across many of the different Lundin Group companies, you'll, you'll have sort of shared board members and, and we try and trade experience across the, the group companies that way. Hey, sorry, JD, BHP, they're in for 5% as well, aren't they? They actually just, uh, we, we raised some money in, in May, June this year and BHP actually just increased their, their stake. So they sit around 6% now. Jamie, I'm really interested to get into the exploration story. The Aussie market loves a nice discovery story. And the the discovery sort of along the Philo trend has been actually a long time in the making. In various incarnations, there's been companies exploring there for the better part of a quarter century now. So I'm interested for you to sort of flesh out. There was even a PFS and a PEA that came out in the late 2010s for you to explain the sort of story to the to the Aussie market. Sure. I mean, I'll go, I'll go quick. Uh, the Lundins first got involved in Argentina through a, a bid for Baja de Alambrero, which was a big copper porphyry um, in Catamarca province. That ended up being subject to a hostile takeout, but the family had generated all this in-country expertise. They had legal advisors and geologists and financial advisors. So they decided to leverage their experience there and, and put that team to find the next thing. Uh, and they discovered the Veladero deposit, which was in a company called Argentina Gold. Uh, that continues to be one of Barrick's big uh, gold producing uh, operations, 500 some odd thousand ounces a year. After Argentina Gold was again taken out by hostile takeout, uh, the same team of geologists went and pieced together this land package that, that we're working today. And that would have been the late 1990s. And uh, you sort of have the Maracunga belt, which was very prolific to the north. You've got El Indio, which was to the south. And there had been this, I don't know, geologic dogma that there was some kind of gap in between these two, uh, you know, prolific mining belts in the, in the Andes. And our, our guys went in on horseback and, and mule and soil sampling came up with 15, 16 different targets. Uh, and through various various corporate entities uh, throughout a, a bit of history, they were in Tenki mining for a little while when, when Tenki Fungarumi, which is an asset we own in the DRC, that was, DRC was in civil war and, and Tenki needed some news flow. So we jammed all these Argentine 
assets into into tanky mining. Once uh, the DRC picked up again and we started working there, uh, these got spun out into what became NGX Resources. And NGX Resources at the time had, had really made a couple of big discoveries. Jose Maria, which is a, a deposit that sits about 12 kilometers to our east, Los Alados, which sits to our, our north, and, uh, and Filo del Sol, which was really early stage. And, and Filo struggled through those early years to, to really garner the attention. Ex, you know, dollars were being raised uh, in equity markets, and those dollars were going into the sort of more advanced projects at the time. So in 2016, we spun off Philo into its own company, Philo Mining. We raised money and we went out to explore specifically for the oxides that are shallow and, and outcropping at surface. We pieced together a, a resource around that oxide and started walking down the line of engineering studies. So we did a PEA, we moved uh, onwards towards a pre-feasibility study. That's a nice uh, little project. Um, so somewhere around 2018, 19, we were faced with a decision as to whether or not uh, the board and management, we wanted to put that oxide heap leach project into production, or uh, as the geologists wanted us to do, focus back towards the, uh, towards the drill bit. We'd never drilled at depth and we'd never drilled underneath, despite knowing that, you know, the, the, the plumbing was in place there there must have been some engine driving the, the 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 placement of the metals in the oxide deposits and we'd not really explored for it so we've put the engineering work on pause and went back to the drill bit uh and and really the success from there is has guided the story it's been uh, you know matt some of those intersections you lifted off at the at the opening just dramatic uh dramatic success with the drill bit some of the best copper gold intersections in the world over the over the past few years and, and continues to get bigger. Jamie, the, the story of Vitunia is is sort of paramount to the the story of um, Philo. And our, our audience being, you know, primarily uh, Australian ASX familiar listeners and, and viewers won't be as familiar with the emerging Vitunia copper district as um, the Canadian audience would be, I imagine. Um, but but you know, understanding the project and also frankly why PHP gives a crap um, is kind of kind of part and parcel of what we're trying to we'll try and convey in, in this piece to sort of set the scene like this the central Andes as I understand it is a bit like the Saudi Arabia of the uh, the copper business um, Chuki Kamada has produced copper in, a, in that area for over a century Escondida has you know over 30 years of um, mining production but if you look at the resource it'll be producing for over a century itself and um, and and the interest in the the Petunia sort of copper district is because it looks like it it's it's set to be another giant metals district. To the listener, sort of unfamiliar with the um, Petunia Petunia story, what what should investors be paying attention to here, Jamie? Well, I think you you hit the nail on the head. You know, it's forty percent of the world's copper comes from this slice of the Andes. And uh, you you know you mentioned a couple of them, but start from the top: Kulwesi, Chuki Kamada, Escondida. Uh, to our south, Andina, El Teniente. I mean, these are the giants of the the copper mining industry. And it's amazing how, uh, you know, that well often cited sort of 80-20 rule holds. Um, and and, and that's, that's exactly what makes people excited about these giant metal deposits. It's, you know, 20% of the value or 20% of all the sort of the, the value from these base metals uh, mines, uh, or 20% of those mines produce 80% of the value, I guess, is, is the way to start thinking of it. So most of the industry's value drivers come from a handful of these giant deposits. And that's that's really what sets the stage for Vicuña. That's why uh, the likes of a BHP is interested here, because we think we're on to what looks like another one of these industry giants. It's, it's not one deposit, it's uh, multiple deposits, it's a clustering of deposits, it's got scale, it's got grade, it sort of has all the earmarks of, of being one of these next great, um, next great copper mining districts. And Jamie, there's a, another facet which we're also pretty unfamiliar with here in Australia being an island, but that the asset or that the ore body straddles both Argentina and Chile. So we, as we understand it, there's a, a bilateral agreement between the two governing how these things sort of progress. But how do you practically think through that? Is it twice as many 
environmental approvals, approvals with the, the native titles and all these sorts of things, government tax treaties and the like, or does that sort of agreement between the two countries make things a bit easier for you? Well, uh, yeah, I'll, I mean, I'll separate that out into two stages, right? There's where we're at right now, which is exploration. And uh, at least at this part of the, the project's uh, history, it's fantastic. We, we have this agreement that exists. It effectively, we sort of control the border ourselves. So the, the re- really the only rules are if you go in from Chile, you have to exit the project from Chile and vice versa. But what that means is we can supply fuel from either country or drilling equipment from either country, drillers, we can you know, drill in Argentina with Chilean rigs and, and, and vice versa. So from an exploration perspective, it's fantastic. Uh, obviously, complications as you start moving towards, towards production. And, and what it means really is, is a duplicate of reporting more than a duplicate of effort. You know, just as with any project, you, you sort of have your ore deposit. You define your area of influence that would go around that. You complete all of your social environmental baseline studies, flora and fauna, the hydrogeological work around that area of influence. And our area of influence just happens to encompass parts of uh, Chile and, and Argentina. And then those go into your environmental impact statements when it's, when it's time to start, uh, start permitting. So, you know, it means that we're, we're moving those impact statements forward on both countries. Um, but the actual body of work that goes into collecting the data is no different than any other project. And Argentina, as a jurisdiction, we've heard quite a bit lately about the sort of instability. They've got elections coming up. They've got extremely high levels of inflation. They've governments defaulted on debt numerous times in the past. How do you sort of work around a lot of those issues, in particularly the, the currency one I'm keen to hear what you think on? It's uh, it's probably been the single biggest reason, guys, that that Argentina has suffered from uh, foreign investment over the years. Really, is is you know you look at a lot of those big projects that we named off earlier in, on the show, and and many of those sit on the Chilean side, not because the geology is any different, but because the the, the fiscal regime has been more favorable uh, to, to foreign investment in Chile. And I think the challenge in Argentina. Um, really at, at the moment is, is right around that currency control. The, the issue is that there's restrictions on, uh, on, on US dollars, how much you can bring in and how much you can export. So if you're going to put X billion of dollars uh, of capital at work in Argentina, you know, as a company, as a lender, anybody who'd be sort of financially interested is going to want to make sure there's a mechanism to, to get those dollars out, whether or not that's that's returning it to shareholders or, or repaying debt. Um, so that's that's the big, I think, nut to crack for Argentina. And, and they're in the midst of, of an election cycle right now. Uh, we should have a, a new government sometime later this year uh, with the, the sort of the first round coming in a, in a couple of weeks. Uh, Cautious optimism, I think that that sort of battling inflation and and uh, changes to these currency control rules to try and encourage uh, investment across all sectors, not only not only mining, it's oil and gas, it's agriculture. But uh, yeah, cautious optimism, I think that that there'll be uh, a better path forward. Jamie, can you help tease out that that currency control issue, uh, you know, a bit a bit for us? Because um, yeah, I, I understand that it's a it's a big deterrent and the regulations sort of require companies to convert export receivables to pesos and to pay tax upon repatriation to the, to the corporate level. Like in practical terms, you know, you don't want that exposure to the, to the peso and that's a, a, the massive deterrent that, you know, investors face. Is that, is that how it works out? Or how, can you tease that? Yeah, out exactly. Yeah. And let's say I'm up and running and we're producing copper concentrate and I sell my copper concentrate to Boleden or Rubis or Glencore. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll get U.S. dollars in, in payment for that, uh, and that has to come back into Argentina, where it then gets converted into pesos, and you build up a, a, a peso balance in country, uh, with restrictions then on being able to uh, repatriate those pesos back to you know, Canadian head office, where we would happen to be, or or, or return it to shareholders, and, and that's the challenge. Uh, they have started some some work there was a a, a new uh, law that was passed where uh there's sort of some some holidays around that so 
one of the one of the new regimes. Uh, it fluctuates depending on how much you invest in country, but you sort of got a, a, a period of time where you're allowed to keep upwards of sixty percent of uh, of revenues generated offshore without having to to bring it in country and convert into pesos, and that's for for new investment in country. And those are the types of initiatives that you know the, I think the mining industry needs to get behind and and, and build on uh, over time, and then get certainty that those um, you know that you've got a longer a longer runway to that um, ultimately before before big big decisions are being made. But we're we're starting to see I think the company the the larger mining companies globally get more comfortable that Argentina is going to move in that direction. You, you've seen Rio Tinto involved in lithium space. Clearly, lots of uh, you know of, of your Australian companies uh, heavily involved in lithium there. BHP lending mining getting involved now in the copper space. You've got South Thirty Two there as well. So. I think uh, it's it's uh, it, interest is picking up. And how much you, you mentioned before, Jose Maria, just not too far, fourteen odd k's, I think, um, away from you guys. How much of a sort of proxy are they? Can you just follow? They're, I guess, a couple years ahead of what Philo currently is. Can you just sort of look to see what they're doing and follow in the footsteps? Is that the way you look at it? Yeah, exactly. Ride the coattails of Big Brother a little bit. There was one more sort of aspect in the in how Latin America works as a, a mining jurisdiction that I want to kind of flesh out with you. So we spoke about a while ago, Coelia Veco, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that right, the Anglo-American asset in Peru. And from discovery until mining, that took almost three decades. And there, there were a number of, uh, of hurdles that the company had to overcome. And one of the key ones was the community engagement and getting the, the local communities on board is is that issue as sort of pronounced in Argentina as it is in the likes of Peru? Uh, every jurisdiction's different, and it, it's it wouldn't be fair to even paint Argentina with a sort of a broad brush. You're going to face different issues in the northern part of the country as you would in, in the southern part. Um, you know where we happen to be is, is San Juan province, and uh, we we touched on it earlier that the projects are remote; they're at high altitude, and, and so that comes with a, a level of complexity in terms of uh, infrastructure challenges, but what you benefit from, of course, is there's, there's no communities anywhere nearby. Um, so, you know, as, as a result, we're pretty fortunate that uh, the, the, the people that are, are in and around uh, our projects are sort of 250, 300 kilometers away, very supportive of, of mining, largely as it's sort of a not in my backyard uh, scenario because it, it's it's legitimately not in their backyard. It's sort of happening up in the Andes and out, out of sight. So uh, benefits for sure for, for us and and certainly in in other areas of of Latin America, whether it's in in Peru, you've got you know community issues that that tend to be a little closer to home from some of those bigger mining operations. So it's uh, something that. Uh, we all have sort of soft issues to, to work through as, as you look towards putting one of these big projects into, uh, into production. And, um, you know, we, we have our own set of challenges. Gotcha. I'm keen to talk about mining now. I can see Maddie's itching to talk about actually I was, mining. I was thinking, <laughs> I will skip that question. Let's get into the mining. Yeah. <laughs> uh, mate, and because with these, first, I'll just a quick question. This is an epithermal porphyry deposit. And when we hear about porphyry deposits, what's the a uh, quick sum up of the difference. Well, what we have on top is is uh, a precious metals rich zone, um, and, it, and it tends to come with sort of different styles and different types of, of uh, mineralization. Um, you know, classic sort of South American copper gold porphyry. That the, the primary copper bearing mineral there would be chalcopyrite, and. Uh, it, it, it would tend to a really nice, uh, clean copper concentrate, but uh, those deposits tend to be slightly lower grade. What we're seeing at Philo is uh, substantial grades in some parts. I mean, we, we've got intersections that ran up over 30% copper. Uh, so you've got slightly more exotic copper bearing mineralizations, lar largely a, a part of that sort of epithermal overprint. Um, so, you know, that comes with it uh, higher grades and, and, and more density of metal, but it also brings with some nasties. So we'll have uh, areas of the deposit that you need to deal with arsenic and antimony and bismuth and, and some of the things that you don't necessarily want reporting to the copper con. So it's, uh, 
it, it's nice to have the it's certainly nice to have the grade and and that grade covers the uh, you know additional cost once we ultimately get into to processing um, but but that's sort of I guess the way you can think about Philo being unique with that epithermal system. I get I guess for the money miners listening when we say porphyry that means fucking huge like just big <laughs> porphyry systems are huge best way to sum it up in Australia and look the slogan your slogan is the world needs more copper like yeah you have to get to the point of mining when you when you're dr- exploring for a deposit like this where do you draw the line of exploration to production because you've obviously got years and years of uh, production already explored for right now where do you start drawing the line to where too much is too much uh, yes really the fundamental question we ask ourselves uh as management and as the board every day is sort of how big is is big enough what we see at, at Philo right now is that we're clearly on that steep part of the learning curve. We're finding new areas of mineralization. We're filling in very critical gaps of our resource model. And in parts where we've already drilled, we're, we're increasing the confidence of our, our knowledge in, the, in those parts as well with the drill bit. So certainly what we see right now and, and, and what our, you know, our, 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 our Big supporters, whether it's the Lundines or, or BHP, it's hey, we, we're interested in understanding where are the limits of this thing, and we haven't yet have, we haven't yet figured that out. We're still in mineralization, 1.8 kilometers from surface. We haven't drilled out of, out of it at the bottom, uh, north, south, east, west. Where despite sort of 120,000 plus uh, meters of drilling that we've put into this thing, uh, we have yet to find the edges, and and that's the goal at this point in time. We're not going to drill that off ultimately to uh you know in, in canadian terms measure you know our measured and indicated uh ni43 101 resource reporting um but we did at least need to get a couple of holes out to those edges to to understand where the blue sky sits and that's the goal and when so when you are drilling out these massive porphyries what what drill spacing defines to get it to actually into that uh indicated category from the inferred i assume it's very different to a small uh like needing 20 meter spacings on a veiny gold deposit how do you pro- how do you get it into an indicated category yeah we're probably looking at close to 200 meter centers um oh, wow. I, you know and there'll be some there'll be some discussion i'm sure bob my vp exploration is going to want us to get down to 100 meter centers um which, uh, you know, adds a significant more amount of drilling in there. But that's, that co- that's that to give you a That costs a lot sense. of money, Bob, if you're listening. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Some of the higher grade stuff, though, we're going to have to drill off tight to, to tighter centers as well, like that hole 41, which was which was a pretty special one for us that we announced in May of, of 2021. That was that uh, 858 meter intersection, a 1.8% copper equivalent. But within that, there was a 160 some odd meter section of, of greater than five and a half percent copper equivalent. So where we see discrete areas of substantially higher grade, then we're, you know, we're going to have to go in and, and tighten up the drill spacing in those areas. But uh, for the most part, it's sort of a bulk homogeneous deposit, and we can we can drill it off um, at wider spacing. So yeah, you updated PFS that come out uh, earlier this year. So it's a look, it's a big open pit heap leach operation. Obviously, the logical place to start with you're pretty much cutting out a mountain. So strip ratio is on your side at one point five seven. But how do you analyze these massive? porphyry deposits as you said you're not you're still hitting mineralization 1.8 kilometers deep how do you weigh them up in an open pit versus underground sense the the topography here works in our in our favor so certainly at this point in time we're thinking this is going to be a you know a giant super pit and uh we had the we had the benefit of visiting escondido with our with our friends at bhp earlier this year uh, they really put in perspective what is a what does a five kilometer by five kilometer super pit look like in the Andes and 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 that's a philo sized pit so that that's exactly how we're sort of thinking of it you know you go through the oxides and and just keep mining until uh, you, you sort of run out of uh, an ability to keep that open pit going and, and and what we're seeing now is that there's likely going to be a transition at some point in time at philo where it moves into uh, bulk underground mining, whether or not that's caving, um, but, but that time's probably 40, 50, 60 years out in the future. 
And what, what's it like in, in remote areas like the Andes, if you do these massive, massive open pits, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, I think I just Googled Escondida's like 650 metres deep. Um, with such bulk, bulk tonnes, getting diesel supply for the trucks, whereas if, you know, you go if you go underground with the big block cave, I know it's a, obviously a big capital and big delay to get there, but then you, you can u- utilise things like solar power, but... How does diesel supply work in the Andes? Yeah, I mean, there's a handful of operations that are working at, um, you know, at that same topography, same elevation. Veladero is, I guess, the largest operation uh, comparable to us and there. Uh, 100 kilometers to our south, still sitting at above 4,000 meters, and and they've been fine actually. The supply chain into into Chile is is reasonable. It's we're about 100 and some odd kilometers from the the town of Copiapó, which is a mining hub, and uh, the topography is pretty steep. So uh, that drive is largely flat, and then you and then you climb up into the mountain range. So uh, you know access to access to diesel isn't isn't an issue. Ultimately, this is a, a, an area that's going to be ripe for uh, new technologies and renewable energies. There's tons of wind. Uh, it's right on the ridge, uh, as, as well as being one of the most solar intensive places in the world. So, you know, as I imagine as, as the more advanced projects like Jose Maria start uh, start looking at that, it's, it's uh, you know, it brings all sorts of things in terms of autonomous uh, haul trucks, uh, electric uh, assist, that kind of thing as they start thinking about, um, you know, how, how to deploy new technologies into a big mining operation in the Andes. Because I think the when you when you talk about underground, as you said, it's like it's decades into the future. So because your current sulphide mineral resource grade is what 0.31 percent copper and 0.34 uh, grams per ton gold, is that what's the what's the confidence level on that at the moment? Is there a lot more drilling to define deeper? Like you mentioned, higher like the very high grades, but look, all those the current sul- sulphide. Resource grades are, look lower than all OU, Tolgoi, KDR East, Casabell, Wafi, Goldpoo, which are all caving operations. But is there – Yeah. Yeah. So I guess what information have you got there for those grades? Well, that that remnant sulphide resource that's there is, is basically the bottom of the, the holes. So imagine the first 15 years of drilling at Philo when we were defining the oxides – uh, once you transition it oxide mineralization and got into sulfides, then you, you, we stopped the drill and we moved it on to the next target. So what that resource is, is effectively categorizing the bottom of those drill holes and, and has nothing to do with the drilling that we've advanced over the past three years. So the, the stuff that we're into now in an area we call Aurora, an area we call Bonita, the grades are going to be uh at least three to upwards of 10 times uh those types of those types of grades and and so that's going to that's going to form the bulk of the ultimate mine plan at at, at philo once you move into the sulfides so when, when is that resource update scheduled to come out yeah good question <laughs> uh, we were not really guiding I, I think the challenge of course is that is that mix between uh, infill drilling and getting confidence in that resource versus uh, continuing to explore and find the edges of the system. And, and so far, the strategy for us has been the latter. You know, I think once we wrap our head around just how big it is, then we'll figure out a plan on on what makes sense in terms of updating that sulfide resource. There's no guidance on, a, on the mineral resource, Matty. <laughs> <laughs> Jamie, on the on the sulfides, it's seen in some of the initial test work that there was a quite high level of arsenic in in one of the samples. How do you guys sort of view that? Or is the focus mainly on just getting the oxides as that it would be mined, you know, much, much sooner all through the test works and everything and leave the testing for the sulfides in more detail later on? No, I, I think you, you, you need to, you need to bring the metallurgical test work for these big projects is so critical. You need to bring that along uh, and move it alongside the the discovery stage of the project too. So we've got another big MET program planned this year. And, uh, you know, there's no question that we'll, we'll have parts of the deposit that are going to be high in deleterious elements and we'll have to figure out how to, how to, how to treat that. We've taken that through preliminary test work. Uh, what's common in this part of the world in, in the Andes with these big uh, porphyries that are high in arsenic is that you've got partial roasting technology where you, you volatize the arsenic and then you capture it 
and stabilize it for, for long-term storage. And, and that's what you see at a lot of uh, Cadelco's operations that are high in, in arsenic. So they'll likely be a portion of this population that, um, uh, you know, that we see at Philo that we'll, we'll need to treat, whether that's through blending or partial roasting. Uh, but the nice thing is we've got the, you know, those are all treatable issues that just take a little bit of additional cost and uh, we've got the grade to deal with that. So the, the MET test work you did in the updated PFS, I think I'll say there was three samples. There was two low arsenic samples and one very high arsenic sample. The two low ones come back with a 0.1% concentrate and the the high one come back with 5.2% arsenic yeah. in the con. Were they were you testing, was that high arsenic one, is that a common one or is that like the end of the spectrum does were these tests the either end of the spectrum to see how the you con got is behaving we, we were trying to we were trying to test the end the the you know the goal posts the ends of the spectrum what you know what what does the stuff look like that's going to be the highest in arsenic what does the stuff look like that's going to be sort of lower and, and more traditional and we're going to have a we're going to have you know multi-billion tons here of uh, sulfide material that's at that low end of the spectrum and then there'll probably be a substantial, uh, you know, a couple hundred million tons of the really high stuff as well. So uh, planning for that in the future, how you want to think about blending, how you want to think about future treatment uh, is, is for the engineers to, to, to figure out right now. It's just understand the, the, the different populations and make sure you've got viable treatment solutions for both of them. Is that, is that ars- the higher arsenic levels, is it um, more prevalent? in the deeper sulfide part or is it more prevalent in the oxide part of the ore body or is it just in pockets everywhere? It's sort of in pockets everywhere. It, it's more prevalent where we're seeing that, you know, the epithermal overprinting and it comes with uh, arsenic bearing copper minerals. So, you know, tenantite and argite, uh, those types of things, which uh, are right in the midst of our Aurora zone where we see some of our best grades. Um, the stuff that you have in the oxides, the nice thing about a heat bleach process is it leaves it leaves all of that behind. So um, it just sits in the it just sits in the in the spent leach pads um, and, and doesn't get uh, disturbed. So you don't have to worry about it uh, through the oxide part of the project. I suppose for the money miners listening, the reason arsenic is such an issue is that in 2019 China reduced the level of arsenic in copper concentrates that will they will accept from half a percent to 0.4 percent so at the do, smelters yeah, yeah at the smelters so do they just pretty much give you a big kick up the arse and send it back to you and not pay for it is that how it works in the copper con world Jamie yeah they sort of call it half a percent they uh, they'll take it anything above sort of 0.5 and and call it one or something like that, then there's ways that you can sell it. There's smelters around the world that'll take that kind of material and they'll just, um, they'll just charge you for the penalty level. Is that in Muslim and then, Russia, is it? <laughs> well, no, there's Chelepec in Bulgaria. Glencore's got some, uh, you know, a, a ability to deal with it. Even Canada, the horn smelter, ver- yeah. various bits and pieces around the world. So, I mean, you can sell it. The traders will take it. Uh, you know, Trafigura and Glencore, and they'll figure out ways to blend it out and 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 make a lot of money on that stuff as well. So what, what you want to try and do is make sure that you've got a plan and a good plan in, in, internally to, to deal with it yourself. So the idea being there's technologies like this partial roasting. You can take a five, you can take upwards of a 12% arsenic copper concentrate, put it through a partial roaster and knock that down to saleable concentrate levels where you can then send it into China or Japan or any of the other, you know, major, major fields. So that that's um, when you've got a deposit like Philo and you've got the size and the grade to pay for the capital for one of those um, roasters, that's that's how you deal with it. Is that, and is that roaster, is that purely dedicated to the arsenic issue or is it also to for the, the sulfides and the refractory component or it doesn't come into account because you're just I, selling I mean, a you concentrate? Got, yeah, the simplistic way to think of it, it's just, it's just to deal with the arsenic. Yeah, and that's pretty – and as you said, that you mentioned um, – Cadelco, we're using it as well. Are they? Is it so? Is it pretty proven um, technology for dealing with the arsenic? It is. Yeah, Minister Halle's uh, a number of the, the you know a number of the big the higher arsenic um, copper porphyries in the Chilean side you know deal with it like that. So Jamie, I um, I know every explorer hates talking about uh, capex, 
but um, as you can see, we're we're a mining podcast, not an exploration podcast. So pretty we, much talk we, about <laughs> capex every day. <laughs> so we, we talk we talk about the um, the practicalities rather than the blue sky upside a bit more than um, a bit more than most interviews, I'm sure. Uh, and I, I guess to to go along with that theme, I'm pretty keen to understand you know the constraints around around water from from sort of the location that um you know that 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 the project is in. Uh, like, is it? Am I correct in sort of in my interpretation that to kind of get the most out of the project in the long run, it's, it'd probably require a desalination plant and a, and a pipeline from the coast to provide that water. You know, it's one of the big benefits of being in Argentina. The, the bulk of our deposit, ninety percent of what's sort of what we found, and almost all of the drilling that we're doing right now is entirely in Argentina. And we have access to groundwater there, which is a, a, a huge benefit. So we drilled off for, for the groundwater resource in combination with uh, our friends at, at Jose Maria when, when they were putting through their feasibility study work there. So uh, there's sufficient groundwater resources within the district to support ongoing mining uh, using that you know, gr- groundwater. I guess plan B is... Uh, interesting in the sense of preparing for whether or not rules or regulations may change in the future. And, and, and this comes a little bit to the broader Lundin group uh, build out of infrastructure within this part of the world. So uh, for those uh, listeners who aren't as familiar, Lundin Mining, which is the big base metals company as part of the Lundin group, uh, they have two assets in Chile that are quite close to where we are. Uh, they've got the Candelaria copper mining complex, which is in the town of Copiapo, about 70 kilometers from the coast. And at the coast, they've actually got a, a desalination plant already built, as well as a, a port that only operates about four days of the uh, four days of the month. So excess capacity uh, in terms of uh, you know supporting desalinated water to Copiapo. Uh, and then recently they've made the purchase of the Casarones mine, which was previously run by the Japanese. And, and that sits very close to Filo, about 30 kilometers to our north. And what's interesting about Casarones is they've already got a full uh, sort of groundwater pumping system that effectively takes groundwater from around the Copiapo Valley, pumps it 100 kilometers uh, up to altitude at, uh, at Casarones. So... You know, the long term, I guess, plan B here is it, it wouldn't take that much for the broader Lundin group to think about building out that desalination facility, tying into the Casarones water pipeline, and then ultimately being able to deliver desalinated water up to the up to the high Andes, which is, you know, exactly what what we see happening at Escondida. They've got a, a 4,000 liter you know, per second desalination facility at the coast that's pumping water up to three and a half uh, kilometers uh, above sea level. So, I mean, that that's how they've managed it because they don't have access to groundwater in Chile. So we've basically got, I guess, plan A, uh, plan A and plan B. Is that is that uh, groundwater, is that hypersaline or is it um, actual fresh groundwater that you have access to now? It's actual fresh groundwater. Yeah, it's actually almost a neutral pH in all of the testing that we've done and, and very, very clean. And would that... would the, the amount of groundwater there now support a 22 million ton per annum processing plan, or that's when you would need additional feed for that? Yeah, we, we uh, that'll support it right now. In fact, it supports that plus the Jose Maria uh, asset. To, I think of, of throughput in sort of tons per day, and that was that was a 150 thousand ton a day uh, milling facility that was going through at Jose Maria plus uh, ours at, uh, at Filo del Sol. So certainly the resource that we've identified today is, is supportive of that. Uh, lots more to discover and, and hopefully future expansions. And this is a, a huge mining complex. So who knows whether or not it's got capacity, you know, to, to where we ultimately get to in size. Jamie. And that's why having that additional plan, uh, that, that additional sort of desalinated plan as a backup option is pretty special. Your point on um, shared shared infrastructure as well received. I think I looked at the you know Vicuña region and you see the area sort of controlled by these juniors, which share a common major shareholder in the Lundin Group. And um, I was sort of reminded of thinking of the the Pilbara region in uh, Western Australia, the iron, iron ore province, when that sort of um, became an, a new hotspot. One common theme in the Pilbara is duplication of infrastructure. The, um, the, the emerging producers couldn't agree to share any infrastructure, so they built like parallel railroads <laughs> and all the rest. Um, I, I kind of think about Vicuña in, in a sense, you know, hopefully 
given the fact that they share a common um, major shareholder, there can be some degree of, um, of, 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 of uh, alignment when it comes to sharing major infrastructure that's required to sort of bring the province um, online. Yeah, I mean, that's that's the dream, right? We see it in North America and in, in Nevada between, you know, Newmont and Barrick as well. Uh, it's these spectacular uh, area of the world with uh, a significant uh, endowment of, of metal and yet, you know, duplicate structures and infrastructure being built all over the place. And that, this, is, this is the incredible opportunity that we have sitting in front of us today within this Vicuña district is, is a bit of a blank slate and uh, potential for, uh, you know, Lundy Mining and whoever ultimately partners to, to think about consolidating this region uh, and, and ultimately building out uh, infrastructure fit for purpose and, and expand it over, over time without, uh, without duplicating things. You sort of touched on it there, partnering, Jamie, and we've sort of seen a bit of consolidation. Like a lot of these companies were spun out of N- NGEX to start. You've got, you know, Philo, Jose Maria, and then Jose Maria was acquired a couple of years ago now by Lundin Mining. How do you sort of think about a, a partnering process or any sort of more consolidation in the area? Do you anticipate it between others? Remerging the merged. <laughs> Remerging the unmerged. Demerged. Remerging, exactly. Jamming it all back together. You, you'll share yeah. the same office, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> we do now. Yeah, <laughs> um, these big projects, it's, it's, it's been a successful, uh, I guess, development path in, for, for many of them in, in sort of the Chilean, Peruvian uh, copper belts, right? You think of Antamina, which has multiple multiple operating partners and, and financial and or offtake partners. And I, I think that's exactly the kind of thing that makes a lot of sense here. The, the Lundin family is clearly going to want to stay uh, involved and they're building out uh, assets and infrastructure within the area through, through Lundin mining. But I think that you know the goal here is to is to probably bring in partners that can help uh, share the risk and and bring their technical expertise and their financial balance sheet to to ultimately you know turn this this what is a dream into um, into actually a pretty significant copper mining complex over time and and that could be Lundy Mining uh, plus uh, you know one of the big one of the big guys whether it's uh, BHP or Rio or Anglo or or anybody else who might want to be involved. You've got, you know, the financial partners from the Japanese offtake to uh, we're starting to see the, 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 the Middle Eastern entities get more active in that sense as well. So at, at this point in time, you know, I think it, everything's sort of on the table in terms of um, what makes sense and, and, and how do we come up with, uh, how does how do Lundin's come up with a plan on, on moving this forward so that you know, they can they can hold on to as much as it is uh, as possible. I think is this a bit of a financing ad for BHP and Rio? It's like in the in the paper. Just let just letting them know <laughs> the boys are interested in a call. <laughs> uh, it's an interesting point you talk about there, touching on um on the financing, Maddie, because um, I, I look at BHP, you know, now on your register with six percent, you say, and um, and I'm curious to sort of understand how you think about financing uh, FDS as the project advances. I look at BHP there and I can't help but, you know, have a bit of um, have a bit of my memory flash back to, to Soul Gold. Now, BHP on Soul Gold <laughs> register. And I remember, I remember Soul Gold, you know, doing a, a financing deal. They raised about US 50 million bucks via a 0.6% royalty over the, the, their project there. And, and Mike Henry, um, CEO of BHP had some, um, some curious words about so that deal. So did Sandy Bizwa yeah, yeah, from Newcrest. Yeah, exactly. They were both fucking pissed off. Uh, totally. And I mean, I guess I'm I'm pretty curious to understand, uh, Jamie, is it fair to say that royalty finance is a, a long way from from being considered um, at the moment to maintain, you know, corporate appeal? Because you know, you know yeah. BHP don't like it. <laughs> I, I Listen, I, I think he I, – my personal opinion is you keep – royalty financing off take financing any of that kind of stuff right to the last last minute when you've got the, the you know the project sort of fully specked out and baked and, and that's when you're going to get the maximum value for it and make sure that at least up until that time you keep it completely unencumbered uh so that the likes of a of a, of a bhp aren't going to be dissuaded by a, a a crappy deal that you've put on on the asset i think bhp would like a royalty if they got the royalty <laughs> <laughs> that's a- <laughs> 
Um, and then I, I guess like, you know, the, the, the broader kind of corporate appeal, like how do, you, how do you think about BHP's involvement? I know you've got a bit of a partnership. You mentioned um, BHP taking yourself to Escondida, you know, earlier earlier this year. Like what what does their involvement actually look like? How do you envisage that partnership manifesting in the future and what do you think their their you know ambitions are for the whole region it's uh it's been incredibly collaborative uh so far it's actually been fantastic we as part of their original investment we established a joint advisory committee and as part of that joint advisory committee uh we had uh, quarterly meetings that were set up. So we sit down with them four times a year and, and give them an update on exploration or strategy, where we're thinking of drilling, what the resources, uh, you, you know, the, the resource outline is sort of starting to look like an opportunity for them to share ideas on, uh, you know, metallurgical test work, or as you can imagine, you know, BHP has a slew of geophysicists on staff and I have none. So, you know, they can opine on some of the geophysics work that we've done and, and say, this is a technique we'd love to see you implement here. And, and, and we, you know, we've traded ideas like that. Um, so it's been great. Uh, ultimately, that sort of ha- has um, has helped that we've, we're all pulling in the same direction. And it would have been easy, I guess, for there to be a divergence there. Uh, you know, one group could have come in and said, listen, we don't care about the blue sky or the upside. We know you've got something great at Philo. You just need to drill this thing off. We want you to race to a uh, an initial resource and put a mine plan around that. Let's get going. Um, whereas our, our interests, I think, have been aligned and let's take our time and figure out just just how big it is and, and you know, what we what we think the ultimate blue sky here is. I think what they want, you know, what they're getting out of it, and 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 Mike's been pretty clear about this in, in conversations, is, is when they're contemplating a new uh, potential mining district or, or in Argentina where they don't have a presence today, uh, it's nice to be able to go in and and, and leverage uh, the experience of groups that do have uh, a long history there, and, and that's exactly what the Lundines sort of bring to the table is thirty years of of operating in Argentina, thirty years plus of of building local relationships, uh, building uh, relationships at the federal level and, and and whatnot. So it's a it's a chance for them to sort of leverage our our uh, historic foothold in country as well. Do you think BHP and look Rio as well, who they're both owners of Escondida, with the world venturing towards electrification, do you think they look at deposits like this and they will attack them a lot differently to how they attacked Escondida historically, but like uh, trying to avoid the, the massive massive footprints, high diesel usage and more looking towards underground and electrification? I think it's, it's probably something the mining industry needs to spend a bit more time and effort on, uh, you know, is, is growing our uh, sort of implementation of new technologies to, to try and reduce the environmental footprint of these big things that the, I guess the one sort of counterpoint is that that is the benefit of these giant operations that are high grade is that you sort of centralize, uh, you know, let's accept the fact that we're putting big holes in the ground. Um, This is an opportunity to centralize that and at least make sure that, um, you you know, all of the all of the scale of multiple deposits uh, can share that infrastructure. So you're not duplicating processing plants. You're not duplicating tailings facilities or roads or access. It's you can leverage some of those big infrastructure items that uh, have, have substantial environmental footprint um, with a, a substantial mining district that's going to be there for a really long time, as opposed to having, you know, let's call it multiple little tiny mines all over the place where you're where you're um, you're, you're creating impact in many many different areas spread out and. The, the same can be said about trying to chase higher grade and you know robert friedland's the, the the key for this one he sort of says you know go to the drc where the, the grades are four or five percent and you you know you're, you're using uh when you're dealing with 10 times better grade you're using 10 times less steel 10 times less uh fuel 10 times less energy that kind of thing and, and so that that sort of also rings true in, in South America and, and some of the stuff that we're finding here. And it's why some of the higher grades that you see at, at Philo also play into that. Beauty. Boys, you got anything else? 
I'm all out. It was fascinating oh. to hear about a an operation in a different part of the world to what we we focus on. So appreciate you coming on, Jamie. I've, I've got one, Jamie. One last one. What? Yeah. Genuinely, what keeps you up at night when you're thinking about the project? I got a bunch of guys running around in the high Andes and water trucks, and it's remote weather. I, I think. You know, any, anybody who's running a, a, an exploration program or is in charge of people out there, I, I, I worry for people's you know, safety. It's not the easiest environment. And I think we all deserve to come home after a day's work. So, uh, you know, it, it always keeps me up at night that I'm going to get a, a, a nasty phone call um, that something bad's happened on the project. Knock on wood, we've had a, a pretty spectacular safety record so far. But um, yeah, it's, uh, let's hope, hope, hopefully we can keep that going. Have you, you got any questions for us, Jamie? You, you might get sick of talking about yourself sometimes. <laughs> yeah, listen, I've I've been a fan. Uh, you know, Trevor's the guy. Uh, Trevor's our VP of Corp Dev and, and IR. He's the guy who sort of put me onto you guys, and he's he's watched it a little bit. I saw the. What did I see? You you did you have Warren Gilman on yeah, the other day? Yeah, yeah. And, and you, you you made him do a, you made him do a bit of a, a pick of a whole bunch of stock tickers at the end. Yeah, the underrated, I overrated as well. Yeah. yeah, underrated, overweighted, and so it, it popped up on my feed because he he uh, he had some nice things to say about Philo. So it's been, I think you guys are doing a great job. I I we don't have anything like this in in North America and. Uh, Trevor and I visited, I was in Australia in, in April this year. We, we ran through Perth and, and Melbourne and, and Sydney, and it's just been, it, it was awesome. Uh, you know, I think interesting to see uh, the number of people that, that, that talked about us and potentially listing on the ASX. And you, you think back to sort of 15 years ago when it would have been the exact opposite. You had all these sort of Australian companies trying to vie for capital in Canada and wanting to list in the TSX. And I think it's reflective of sort of the amount of capital that's there and the genuine understanding of, of, of mining that, that that Australian market has. So it probably, it probably also has something to do with the fact that we've got absolutely sweet fuck all good copper stories on the ASX. Yeah, so. no, not many copper porphyry over here. So. <laughs> well, it's right, eh? After, I mean, after Oz Minerals uh, was, uh, was taken out, um, it's the sort of slim pickings. Yeah, very much. Right, mate, thanks very much uh, for coming on. Good, always uh, good to head across the ditch and uh, mix it up for the money miners. So, uh, yeah, really appreciate it, mate. Cheers, best, Jamie. Best of luck okay. with the drill bit. Much Thank appreciated, you very much. Hopefully Cheers. it's not down to luck. You're welcome to invite us to the um, to the Andes to smoke a dart 4,000 metres above sea level too. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I'll probably pass out. But bloody, yeah. They're probably, yeah, actually probably too risky taking us up. You'll have one of those safety incidents, uh, incidents that you're trying to avoid. <laughs> Thanks, Jamie. Cheers. Thanks, guys. Right, boys, what do you reckon? Awesome, awesome scale discovery. You know, fascinating to hear how they're going to you know, try and keep expanding the discovery mm. and then potentially develop it in the future. I found it super interesting to learn about everything going on. You know, the the Lundeen family, you got the Casserones mine and all of that going ahead. So yeah, a lot a lot to get up on and a lot we don't talk about so much here. A lot of chat, a lot of chapters to go in that book too. Mm. Very very early days, but as we as we discussed, there's a point where you sort of. Yeah, mate, the world needs more copper and hopefully these guys can turn it in in, you know, not decades in the future, but this can be a copper mine in the not too distant future. I think it's pretty easy to have a decade plus heap leach open pit running while you can uh, potentially drill the fuck out of it and go deep and uh, go down a a block cave route as well. It's not a bad bad cash model. I'd love to chat with um, Adam Lundeen. Um, the Lundine family are the kingmakers in this region, and mm. um, I'd really love to love to chat with him about the, the overarching strategy here. Yeah, Ads, we'll, just give me a call, mate. We'll uh, we'll <laughs> fit we'll fit you in, mate. That'd be great. Squeeze that, him in along with Gina and Chris. Yeah, yeah. Oh, look, dude. If Adam calls straight away, he goes straight to the top because obviously Gina and Chris are um, haven't been in contact, so. Ads will put you above Gina, Reinhardt and Chris Ellison. If they you can go on, on the back burner, huh? Yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll put, chuck them on the bench. Perfect. couple of sponsors to thank, guys. Oh, yeah, the Anytime, Anywhere, Any Altitude Exploration Services, Seamus Murphy, give us give them a call before they get the Philo contract. That's it. K-Drill, Terra Capital, JP Search, and... Oh, Smec, Smec Power and Technology, mate. This would be a good spot to install some batteries and solar and bloody all sorts of power things over there. We'll get them the... Con- we'll pretty much get... if So if we get Smec, K-Drill, anytime, the contract's over there, and then when they start developing a white-collar workforce, we'll get JP Search to recruit for them. Mate, we'll make a 
Talk about referral fees. Mate, we're just hooking a royalty onto all their revenue streams. We'll be laughing. Money of mine has officially modified the business model as of today. <laughs> Love Boys, it. cheers for that. And uh, thanks, Jamie, for coming on. Hooteroo. Hooteroo, money miners. The information contained in this episode of Money of Mine is of general nature only and does not take into account the objectives, financial situation or needs of any particular person. Before making any investment decision, you should consult with your financial advisor and consider how appropriate the advice is to your objectives, financial situation and needs.